Today's presentation is about how I believe museums can shift mindsets and adopt new methods to keep up with the rapidly changing world. I have been presenting on this topic for quite a few years, always advocated for a digital first perspective and making priorities for the distributed museum, a museum that is much more than its museum building, website and social media channels. A museum that consists of an ecosystem of touch points, channels and formats. The need to adapt to a rapidly changing world is of course not new and I'm sure that you have heard talks on this topic many times before in different contexts. For me, this has in the past year meant focusing less on technology but much more on human interaction and heritage storytelling and how these stories are presented. My core message with this presentation is the need for museums to rethink content, formats, interaction and channels. And more specifically, I suggest that transmedia storytelling can be a relevant toolbox for museums. More specifically, again, <laughs> I believe methods like transmedia storytelling has very much to offer for museums wishing to stay relevant. Uh, and storytelling is widely known as a more efficient way to convey messages, affect behavior, and to make facts more available and understandable. And as museums, again, they are distributed across more than just the museum building and the most immediate online channels. Telling stories will by default need to be done across an ecosystem of channels and formats. And for museums also wishing to reach further than its museum walls and online only experiences, this is relevant to also consider hybrid or even analog experiences in other places. Uh, and this is at least the case for us as a regional museum, wishing to meet its audiences where they are. So, briefly about me, before we get into today's presentation. Um, as Concha mentioned, I have been working for quite a, some time in the heritage sector, in fact, since the mid-1990s. I've always worked some way or the other with digitization of heritage, but as the years went by, I've realized it becomes necessary to look more broadly into the development and organizational structures of museums as this strongly affects how we as museums can meet the challenges caused by a digital society. And this has meant that I also made the choice to four years ago shift from a purely digital department at a national museum to a regional museum working both with public offerings and collections. And this is of course due to that we are quite a small museum. Uh, West Norlands Museum is situated about five hours north of Stockholm, a somewhat sparsely populated region with about 250,000 people. And West Norland is also part of southern Sápmi, the region traditionally inhabited by the indigenous Sámi people. But then, turning back to today's topic, I started by mentioning that museums are facing challenges in a rapidly changing world. But what are those challenges? And I believe some of the presentations here today have already touched upon this, of course. And the catalyst is, in many ways, digital technologies, our everyday use of internet and social media, but the challenges range over a much broader spectrum. Though digital is central in driving this transformation, the actual challenges are only to some extent based on new technologies. Rather, they concern new audience behaviors and expectations. A demand for personal experiences participation as well as expectations of multi-sensory and multi-dimensional and event-driven experiences. And young generations today are socially conscious, express themselves in digital channels. They have access to information and social connections from all over the world. Information and experiences are consumed in a personalized manner. Like I can choose which TV series to watch when I want to. I can choose which podcast or music to listen to. I can join movements that suit my agenda and values, and that also help me build and strengthen my own identity. And then there are, of course, several major global challenges, as has been mentioned before here today, that truly can and will affect museums, such as climate change, pandemics, um, anti-democratic movements, and war. And these challenges are, of course, um, impacting us as museums, which in turn demands us to ask new questions. What does a museum offer in digital channels? 
How do we cater for the digital-only audience? And what does this mean in terms of shaping new museum experiences? How and what does our audience consume and experience online? How can we find out what they want and need? And how can we compete with other mediators of cultural history, for example, on TikTok or YouTube? There are many different actors telling heritage stories online, and what is then the role of museums online? How do we make cultural heritage relevant to more people, and how do we reach a wider audience? We have the opportunity to reach wider audiences online, but it's often easier said than done. And the audience, they use many different channels and platforms online, and how do we adapt content to them all? And how do we make content coherent across channels and formats? How can we connect the content between channels in a way that makes sense to the audience? And perhaps most importantly, how do we contribute to a sustainable society with cultural and historical mediation? There are many of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that museums need to address. How do we do this while meeting all these new challenges that museums face? So, sure, digital screens, we all know that, but do we really know this is what the audience wants? What about um, seeing real objects? Um, I often hear arguments that audiences want to see and experience real authentic objects, and of course they do and they should. There is no opposite in this. On the contrary, combining digital and physical is even better. One can even use the trendy word, digital, the combination of physical and digital. But still, having statistics at hand is necessary. These stats show the use of social media in Sweden in a recent report. Young people in their teens, 20s and 30s are frequently using social media. Again, I'm sure that most of you here, you're very well aware of this and you don't need convincing, but you might be the one starting the conversations in museums. You need to convince managers, board members, and co colleagues about the need to make a shift in priorities and to show that people are actually spending a lot of time online. Consuming content online is important. And besides knowing the sheer number of people using social media daily, we need to know what people do online. And this information is from the very same report as the previous slide about internet habits in Sweden 2022. For example, when they use YouTube, when we use YouTube, we seek entertainment, information and instructions, listen to music, watching a documentary. Facebook is more for social connections, to participate in interest groups and get information about events. Instagram is consuming content firstly and post own content secondly. And TikTok, consuming content of interest made by users that I don't know um, personally. And having these discussions internally is very important. What does this mean? How do we use each channel? So, as I started by mentioning, I believe that one way forward to address challenges that museums are facing is to turn to transmedia storytelling. And this is not meant to sound like a simple magical solution, but rather a toolbox to navigate different parts of the challenges. And storytelling, uh, most museums are already great storytellers. I, I don't want to say anything else. We tell stories also through programming, events, and sometimes through exhibitions. But the list of benefits of using storytelling is almost never-ending. Stories are a huge part of our cultural heritage and society. They're an important way of passing our history on to future generations. In digital channels, they can quickly capture attention and in the next step retain interest. Stories, they do evoke emotion, which in turn improves learning. Stories stick. And we can better compete with an ever-growing range of digital content online. Stories can also be adapted to many different channels, and we need to do this as there is no one-size-fits-all. And narrative is a way to structure an experience, the journey through the story. Uh, storytelling can also, of course, strengthen the connect connection to the museum's brand, and it's a way to contribute with more perspectives and multiple voices. 
So what does the ecosystem mean for telling stories? As I mentioned before, museums are distributed across many channels and formats, large number of touch points where the audience can encounter the museum and its stories. <laughs> and to illustrate this, I often use this type of image to start the conversation with colleagues to remind ourselves, ourselves that we can't create content and stories just for the exhibition or for a social media post, not when we have the opportunity to spark engagement and open up paths into the magical universe of the museum. I want to stress that this is not the actual detailed mapping of our museum ecosystem. This image is to spark conversation and ideas. The next step would be to make an actual map and connect the content with the dots and the dots with each other. And of course, the user, the audience should be at the center of this map. But the point is that distributed across multiple media channels, the story becomes a transmedia story. And in my conversation with museum colleagues around the world, I've found that this is not yet a common term in museums, so I wish to just make a brief stop at the definition of transmedia storytelling. And we can start with Henry Jenkins' uh, original definition. Transmedia storytelling represents a process where integral elements of a fiction get dispersed systematically across multiple delivery channels for the purpose of creating a unified and coordinated entertainment experience. And as you can see, this definition is very much connected to entertainment business. Museums, on the other hand, have a broader mission to make heritage relevant, contribute to sustainable society, etc. So this, I mean, is a definition alone that is not enough for museums to, to work with. So, why transmedia storytelling in museums? When we talk about transmedia storytelling in a museum context, we see that, as I mentioned before, museums consist of an ecosystem of channels and touch points. Uh, but transmedia storytelling is also always based on shared authorship. Uh, it's rarely or never a single voice that is heard. Multiple voices in turn open up by default to dialogue and multiple perspectives. And a diverse dialogue also opens up for the opportunity to influence and create positive and social change. Stories and narratives encourage us to seek information, to think more deeply about what we hear, and to consider what it means and how we might react in similar circumstances, and to remember the information longer. And this is also what sets transmedia storytelling for pure entertainment, apart from transmedia storytelling experiences based on the mission of museums. And I co can go on with <coughs> a longer list. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Another interesting possibility is that we, when planning museum experiences for the ecosystem, we can aim at capturing visitors at one end of the ecosystem and lure them further into the magical universe of the museum or further into the story. And multiple channels also means multiple formats, and several formats in turn enables us to reach new audiences. They also enable us to design an experience with many dimension, dimensions, not just to offer an encounter with a story in the form of a social media post or a text label in an exhibition. And many dimensions and interaction as one of the characteristics of transmedia storytelling enable the audience to learn and discover more about the story. The story then becomes something to explore, experience and delve into. In this quest, the audience can take on the role of either co-creator or explorer. And I want to just mention that specifically game mechanics is a way to advance the story for an interactive and or exploratory experience. It can create a feeling of commitment of being able to contribute to the action and to the result. And further about transmedia storytelling in museums. Opening up for many voices and for co-creation of stories can build trust with underrepresented com communities. It can specifically open up new perspectives on and relationships with a place. Stories can direct the spotlight on social challenges and contribute to possible specific solutions for positive social change connected to that particular place. And transmedia storytelling has an ability to illuminate the relationships between people, places, and practices that in turn can affect social change and cultivate a positive public investment in terms of engagement and possibly resources. So that's why I'm looking kind of for a different definition that could be of interest for museums. 
Social me transmedia storytelling has the potential to be much more than just pure entertainment, and therefore I would like to use a different definition. I would argue one that is more useful for museums. Um, transmedia storytelling, and this is from Donna Hancock's from Australia, uh, a quote from the book Revolution in Transmedia Storytelling Through Place. Transmedia storytelling is more than a practice and a process centered around digital technology. It is a framework, or uh, sorry, it represents an original way of thinking and creating the narrative. It includes traditional literacy, understanding of writing, design thinking, user experience, and collaboration. So, with this, I would like, just like to say that uh, transmedia storytelling is, of course, not a magical solution, but rather a toolkit, a method, and uh, something that we at our museum will try to work with. So how do we take the first steps? Uh, in this part of my presentation I'll share some ongoing projects that we have at Western Orleans Museum that will explore transmedia storytelling in different ways. As I mentioned earlier, I often use for internal discussions an illustration to uh, illuminate the ecosystem of channels and touch points where we as a museum can meet the audience. And creating awareness of this I found very important. To start discussions around how we can create content for the ecosystem and plan for this at the very beginning of the project. But we also need to start exploring new ways of working, new methods, and this means again opening up the transmedia storytelling toolbox. Uh, and through pilot projects, we need to learn more about audience needs and behaviors. We need to further develop how we work with inclusive methods. And when developing new experiences, how to, do we design for interaction? And how can we create lo engage local communities connecting heritage storage with place, with social impact and sustainable development as a goal? So, these key issues and questions need to be connected to actual projects and initiatives to be implemented within our museum, both long-term work with exhibitions and programming, as well as temporary projects. I'll briefly mention here two ongoing projects and a concept that will help us channel discussions internally and focus on goals and new priorities. Uh, we are working again with permanent exhibitions. Uh, we have a new concept called To Capture a Place and we are launching two pilot projects. So the concept To Capture a Place um, has become a tool for innovation and exploration around new museum experiences. It's meant for us to build our own toolbox uh, for working with municipalities and communities around the region. The concept builds on a previous exhibition and is under constant development. Uh, it all started with an exhibition that we developed during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. We had received specific funding to develop an exhibition together with a non-profit organization delivering uh, awards to, to artists in the region. And the common denominator for us all the recipients of the awards and the museum was that we all tell stories built on museum collections, objects, archival material, photographs, etc. The award winners were an author, a musician and a theatre company. And in this exhibition we focused on packaging all content in story format. And I'll share one of these short stories with you just as an example. And this micro story was created for an exhibition label about the fire in the town of Sundsvall in 1888. And the story goes like this. June 25th, 1888, shortly after 12 at noon. <clears throat> Sweden's largest urban fire. A small fleeting spark devastated an entire town. 9,000 out of 10,000 inhabitants in Sundsvall became homeless Five perished in the flames. The city was in ruins after the fire, nine hours later. It is believed that a spark from the steam fry at Sealong caused the fire. It was dry and windy, and the first building to catch fire was a brew house. The church bell and the bell in the town warned and rang. The heat melted the church bells, 
and a letterpress was created from the remains of a town. And this is the actual letterpress, letterpress that was displayed uh, in connection to this story. And this is what um, the, the exhibition displayed looked like. It was deliberately designed to give a sense of almost stepping into the collection storage spaces. We were emphasizing the museum as a teller of heritage stories, at the same time as we shared previously known or unknown stories. And during the development of the exhibition, we also realized we are lacking stories in our collections database. So being told stories by the museum is in fact not very common. And not unsurprisingly, there are voices and stories that are completely absent from our repositories. This exhibition started many rewarding discussions internally and led to the development of the concept to capture a place. A concept that, that will live on and be developed beyond the exhibition. The purpose is not only to tell stories, but to collect new stories, co-create stories, and retell old stories. And one of the first steps we're now taking with the concept is to collaborate with the neighboring municipality, Kromfors, around heritage stories. And we are working with the head of cultural affairs as well as a communications manager from the municipality. And this is a small pilot initiative with very limited resources. We just put in working hours. But it's a great opportunity to explore how we can collaborate the museum and the municipality around heritage storytelling. And the purpose of the project is mainly to explore the benefits of heritage stories. It is a way to make space and time to ask ourselves questions. How can heritage stories contribute to a more sustainable municipality? How can storytelling as a method contribute to tell the story, history of Kramfors to more people? But what are the needs and benefits for organizations, the municipality and local businesses? And how do we reach more people? What do heritage stories mean for place and identity? And how do we deliver and tell the stories? It's important to discuss also what language and vocabulary do we use? Because how do we talk about sparsely populated areas, exclusion and unemployment? And how do we choose stories to package? How do we tell stories in a new way? And how do we deal with difficult topics and conflicting narratives? How do we promote and share diversity of stories? How do we make invisible stories visible? And how do we fill in with fiction where we partially lack facts? Through asking these questions, we can discover new potentials of stories connected to the municipality, but we're also making space and time for developing the museum's role in relation to place and digital storytelling. And then we have another project which actually has some funding. Uh, Smart Heritage Tourism in the High Coast of Sweden is a brand new project which will be performed mainly in 2023 and it will build on the same principles, exploring place, identity and heritage storytelling, but also how heritage stories can become a resource for local communities and businesses. An end user group here are tourists visit visiting the region, so called smart tourists. And what is smart tourism? I just learned that Valencia is the European capital of smart tourism in 2022. <laughs> and I am absolutely no expert in this area. I just look at the term from a regional museum perspective. And this quote uh, is from the website visitvalencia.com. Smart tourism is about ensuring the best possible, possible experience for visitors, utilizing innovative technologies and a healthy mes measure of creativity and this experience must be accessible to all. Of course, as you know, the term is about so much more than this, but for museums it's important to reflect on the fact that tourists use internet and smartphones to plan the trip and to take part of experiences. And, uh, by, <laughs> and this is where things get quite interesting, I think. The tourism sector is fully embracing the concept of smart tourism and are even developing online and hybrid experiences. And heritage is a very large and even growing part of tourism. In this, I sense that many museums would benefit from defining their role much more clearly. How do we, we cater for the smart tourists in a way that supports sustainable local communities and of course, the sustainable development and care of heritage sites? And these are some examples of what is being developed and offered right now. Uh, this is Amazon Explore. Uh, it's been a service for online experiences, though I think it's actually being um, discontinued um, as of next week. 
but there are other so, uh, companies offering uh, online experiences. So this is a Japanese company offering travel experiences, tours and adventures, and they are also offering online experiences. And here we have Airbnb. They have for some time explored experiences uh, on site, but are now also offering online experiences. And this is something I came across just the other day. It's called Spellbound by Visit Sweden. Um, Sweden welcomes you through a chilling audio story by renowned author John Ivy de Lindqvist. And the twist? You can only take part of it in the Swedish forest. And if you read on the website, it says, we'd like to invite you to experience our country's nature in a way that you've never done before. Sweden's nature has always been an integral part of our culture and played a central role in Swedish folklore. Inspired by this heritage, please note it's the word heritage, internationally celebrated author John Ivy de Lindqvist has brought some of our mythological creatures to life in a chilling tale and audio story, only available for listening to in our Swedish nature. I think this is genius. It's, I love it. <laughs> and for, for those of you who don't know, John is the author of the well-known novel Let, Let the Right One In uh, about a child vampire. Um, so why are they doing this and we are not as museums? <laughs> so back to the Smart Tourism Project. In the past years I have felt the need to further explore the development of new museum experiences, location based as the spellbound experience is, and based on heritage stories but also the mission of our museum. And this project we will focus on a period of 700 years starting with the medieval times and ending with the local witch trials in the 1670s. And these were the most severe trials and executions in the history of Sweden. So some of the stories included in the project are already well known and will be retold in new formats. We'll develop five in total location-based experiences in 2023. And these are pilot projects that we aim at developing and scaling further. And I'm very happy that we have space and time and funding to explore. And one of the main goals is also to develop experiences in close collaboration with local communities and businesses. And besides creating actual experiences, another important goal is to create a sustainable repository of stories that others can build on. And finding the balance here will be important. Should the museum be experience designer or and <laughs> should the museum be a resource for, for others to, to use? Of course, I think we should be both, but we need to find a balance. Uh, some challenges, of course, will be, um, as I mentioned, I have mentioned many of the challenge, challenges before, but addressing them will also help us develop a role and upcoming priorities. Again, I mentioned we will be retelling old stories, and there are individuals and small businesses telling the very same stories. How can we step in and deliver something that is beneficial for all? How can we open up for collaboration? And about shifting mindset. And to develop new museum experiences, we need to adopt an explorative mind, be open for completely new formats. We also need to discover which competencies we need to com complement what we already have in museums. Making new prior priorities is a learning process for the museum. And then about mapping the ecosystem. One fundamental step, I believe, is to map our ecosystem. Where do we deliver the stories? How can we, can we do this? How do we use the formats and channels that we already master and know? And also, we'll be starting from scratch, almost. Uh, and I believe that perhaps the biggest challenge of all is here that there is no blueprint or toolbox. And as, for example, Antje was talking about earlier, we need to make time and space for exploration and pilot projects is then essential. So, besides Donna Hancock's definition of transmedia storytelling, I wish to leave you with another quote from the brand new book, Role Play as Heritage Practice, Historical LARP, Tabletop RPG, Role Playing Games and Reenactment by um, yeah, Michal Mohoki, I'm not sure I can pronounce that name right, from the Kazimierz Wielki University in Poland. It's a fantastic book, I recommend it really. And he says that it is not uh, ICT, information and computer technology, but authenticity, interaction and storytelling that will be key factors for the innovation of museums 
and the creation of value for visitors. Thank you. <laughs>